Hi everyone, welcome to this week's edition of Water Talks. Uh, appreciate you guys uh, joining us once again. Um, today we're talking about uh, water quality modeling and in indoor ICMs. It should be um, pretty exciting um, work and some interesting case studies and stuff like that. Can I get to the next screen, please? You there, Chris? <laughs> yeah. Okay, do you want to advance it? Sure. So I think I can advance it. There we go. <laughs> All right. Um, so my name is Ryan Brown. I'm a systems solutions engineer here with Innovise. I've um, been here for a couple of years now, um, doing a lot with our storm sewer flood products, uh, including ICM. Uh, but water quality is not something I've dove into very well. So that's why we got Chris here today. Give us, uh, uh, Chris, you want to introduce yourself? Sure, thank you, Ryan. I'm Chris Rank. I am the Collection Systems and Wet Weather National Planning Leader for Black & Veatch. I'm based in Indianapolis, Indiana. I've been doing this uh, water quality, hydraulic, transient modeling type things for um, 21 years now. Um, I'm a former uh, Technical Practice Group Chair from WEF's Collection System Modeling Task Force and also recently led the Envision Task Force for WEF. Um, but yeah, really excited and really appreciate the opportunity to present today. All right, so uh, if you haven't been to one of these before, it's a pretty simple concept where we're really just trying to uh, be kind of open for everyone and be able to ask questions and things like that. Um, it's as simple as just uh, typing your uh, questions or comments into the uh, comment bar there. Uh, only Chris and myself will see it, so please feel free to ask me and all questions, and we'll uh, find some time to, to get to them, uh, if not during the presentation, at least uh, during a follow-up. Uh, we do have some uh, upcoming uh, water talks, and, and I'm noticing actually on November 9th that is, is not the that's not the correct one, but the, oh well, it's going to be actually an update for uh, new things that have come uh, to ICM within the past uh, year to a year and a half. Um, and then also on the uh, November 16th, uh, looking at uh, a client case study using InfoAsset Planet to prioritize some uh, main replacements. Um, and I guess with that, I'll, I'll hand it over to, to Chris for the bulk of the uh, presentation and, and what we're going to talk about today. Thanks, Ryan. Um, yeah, really excited today to talk about water quality modeling and InfoWorks ICM. Um, I think this is a bit of a hidden gem or a hidden feature as we haven't really seen a lot of uh, water quality models for rivers or channels or ditches or any other kind of uh, kind of open channel flow element. Um, it's not really used a lot in the United States or in North America. Um, and I'm, I feel that I'm in a good place to present this as we talked about distribution system water quality modeling in last week's water talk as well. So I'll give a brief agenda uh, here I'd like to first start off talking about water quality model applications, what you're trying to accomplish. It is different than what you do in a distribution system. Um, we're not as concerned too much about water age or chlorine residuals. Um, this is really more about things like bacteria, nitrogen, and phosphorus um, in water bodies. Um, I'll give an overview of the typical framework used for water quality modeling. And then I'd like to dive into what it would be like for getting started in ICM, or if you happen to have an existing water quality model on the shelf, how you might convert that and bring it into ICM. And then I'll give two case study examples for dissolved oxygen modeling and all the parameters that go with it, and then give a case study of bacteria, and then close on the benefits and limitations of using ICM for water quality modeling. So first off, um, I'd like to talk a bit about what water quality models are used for. And this is specific to um, water bodies and collection system and stormwater applications. Now I'd like to apologize in advance. I don't really have the ability to uh, introduce this topic without throwing a lot of acronyms out there. But I promise you I'll be consistent with the acronyms throughout this presentation. Um, so there's really four main use cases within the United States or North America. Um, if you have a combined sewer system, your combined sewer overflow long-term control plan, your CSO LTCP, um, that program is really about water quality. They're often focused on reducing overflows to a certain size or a certain frequency. 
But in the end, the Clean Water Act is seeking compliance with the water quality standard built around the designated use of the stream. And the next main case is the National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System, your NPDES permit, which exists for any wastewater treatment plant, wastewater recovery facility, um, or any permitted point source discharge. So we've got a hand raised here, Ryan. If there's a question you want to, um, someone says they're not seeing the presentation. Is everybody else able to get to it? Yeah, I'm, I'm seeing it just fine. I was, I was just responding. Um, okay. was you might, you might want to log out, and log back in. That might be a trick, but. Um, all right, thanks, Ryan. I appreciate that. Um, so the NPDES permit system, it's a five-year cycle that you go through renewals and reapplication. The NPDES permit is looking at the plan discharge and the ambient water quality in the water body that's receiving the discharge. Next up is the total maximum daily load, the TMDL program. This is done on a watershed level. It's done at a little more coarse of a resolution than the first two examples. In a TMDL, this could be for bacteria, can be for nutrients, they can even be for narrative criteria, um, as well as solids. And you're looking at the kind of load that the water body can absorb. And then that load is distributed to, and allocated to different sources. That can be the point discharges, non-point sources, agriculture, things like that. And then last up, the municipal separate storm systems, MS4. These are separate from combined sewers. It's when you have separate sanitary and storm sewers. But MS4 permits often regulate TM, uh, sorry, TSS, total suspended solids. And also things like nitrogen and phosphorus will show up as well. And these four programs, well, they do exist on their own. They often are connected. Uh, CSO LTCP or an NPDS permit will often reference or be part of a TMDL. And sometimes the MS4 system will as well. So now that I've hit you with a whole bunch of acronyms, Let's talk a bit, assuming I can advance the slides here, let's talk a bit about what water quality models are used for in each of these programs. So it really comes down to what kind of question you're trying to answer with the water quality model. For combined sewer long-term control plan, your CSO program could spend hundreds of millions of dollars, billions of dollars. And the question at the end is, this big investment we're making, is it going to meet the water quality standards or not? And how close might it come if it's not? And the constituents, which are the parameters or the pollutants that you're modeling, typically in a long-term control plan is gonna focus around bacteria, um, but nutrients and dissolved oxygen will also be part of the analysis sometimes, depending on the type of stream and the nature of the discharge. The type of events that you'll be modeling in this water quality model, they're often done for single event design storms, but what's becoming more common is a continuous application say a recreation season where disinfection is required from April to October or an entire year is evaluated. For your NPDES permit, the question you're trying to answer is, will the design discharge of this treatment plant meet the water quality standards? And you're typically looking at nutrients as well as dissolved oxygen in this analysis, but your model events very different than in the CSO question. You're looking at the 7Q10, which is the 10-year minimum seven day average flow, basically the rock bottom minimum flow. And in a highly urbanized area, you might find that the discharge coming out of the plant is far greater than your 7Q10 flow um, in that analysis. This is sometimes also referred to as a WQBEL type of analysis system. In the TMDL, the total maximum daily load, the question is what load allocation can the watershed absorb while maintaining standards? The TMDLs can be for a wide range of things, um, they're typically for bacteria, nutrients, or suspended solids. But the types of events in the resolution of the model are a little different than, say, a CSO LTCP application. You're looking big picture at the watershed, the loadings that are coming in. Um, you might have a time step of a day, whereas you could be five minutes in a CSO application. And you're looking at average daily conditions, and then usually a defined critical conditions, which could be a recreation season, it could be a critical day or month. And then finally, the MS4, the stormwater programs, a question you might be trying to answer is, we're doing a green infrastructure program. What load reduction are we expecting to accomplish? And you're typically looking at suspended solids, but could also be looking at nutrients and bacteria. Your type of events you're going to evaluate could be a single store, but also looking just overall your average annual rainfall or average conditions. 
So those are the types of things water quality models are used for. But now I'd like to talk a bit about the framework of water quality modeling and some of the software packages that are commonly used. And by no means is what I'm going to present a complete list. I just wanted to capture some of the main ones that are used. So the first element of the water quality model is your river flow, your hydraulics, your hydrodynamics going through the water body. This could be a channel, a ditch, a river, an estuary. And those are often modeled in programs like SWIM or a watershed model like HSPF. Um, InfoWorks is used quite a bit, uh, predominantly in 1D. And then more complex uh, estuaries or wide rivers. For 2D applications, we'll see a program like EFDC or Delft or some other CFD type of applications come in. So that's your river hydraulics, but now let's talk about what's loading it. Your source flow and loads, which typically come from stormwater sources or point sources like overflows, CSOs, treatment plants. Um, those are often done within SWIM or within InfoWorks. This is sometimes referred to as your pipe network or your landside model. And then the loads can be developed at a watershed program like HSPF or LSPC or SWAT. And then also SWIM has some runoff uh, capability to do buildup and wash off. And now that you've brought it all together, you have your hydrodynamics, your flows, your loadings into your water body, the actual water quality calculations are your reactions, um, diffusion, advection of the pollutants. Um, that's typically done in a program like WASP, uh, which is maintained by US EPA, um, CQAL or QAL2K. And connected models are, are very common, particularly in the US. So you have something taking care of your, your H and H, your hydrology and hydraulics, and then it's loading something for water quality. So a question that comes up in the framework of water quality modeling, particularly for dissolved oxygen, is how complicated should it be? And if you've been doing this for a long time, you might recognize this table that comes out of the WASP documentation from the early 90s. Um, this is maintained by Colorado State University, this particular document. There's six levels of complexity that it steps through. At the simplest level, you have Streeter Phelps which is an equation you might have been exposed to in college. It is working with dissolved oxygen and BOD, which is the biochemical oxygen demand. Basically, what's in the stream, how much oxygen it's going to consume. The next level of complexity is modified Streeter Phelps, where you're adding ammonia nitrogen. And then as you keep stepping forward, you add the rest of the nitrogen cycle. When you get to step four, you're adding phosphorus and algae. You want to bring in algae if you're seeing diurnal swings in your dissolved oxygen, which is not very different than a, a diurnal flow pattern in dry weather sanitary flow. What happens is, is during the day, photosynthesis is going on, so the algae is producing oxygen. Then at night, there's no ability for photosynthesis. The algae, they're just like us. They need oxygen to live, so they're going to consume it. If you're seeing those swings, you need to bottle them. That's when you bring in phosphorus and algae. And then the next steps get more complex, even going to sediment. And the examples that I'll give will be a combination of steps four and six, phosphorus, algae, and sediment, which I'll show in a few slides. So let's say you want to get started. You have ICM, you need, you need to develop a water quality model, you'd like to get going. Before you get too far ahead, some questions you want to ask yourself. Is the stream appropriate for 1D or 2D? In 1D, one dimension, you're fully averaged across your cross section. So your, your nitrogen at, what, at the north end is the same at the south end when you're flowing east to west. Um, 2D cap water quality modeling capability came in later than the case studies I'll show. It works with the 2D surface, um, but I believe there's the ability to do some 2D from some conversations Ryan and I have had. And then really this is the biggest question is what are you planning to model? Do you want dissolved oxygen? Do you just want bacteria or sediment? Um, what parameters do you want to establish? And then also, what kind of data can you collect to build this model and verify that it's accurate? An important question at Forks is, do you want to have separate model groups for your pipes and ditches that you likely already have, and water quality being a separate model group? Or do you want to integrate it and have one run to do hydraulics and water quality? And then another important question is, do you want a model set as sediment transport or not? The native InfoWorks buildup and washoff routines where the pollutants are generated require sediment transport because they're attached to sediment. More recently, ICM has brought in the swim buildup and washoff capability, which doesn't require the use of sediment. You also have the ability to use what's in the purple icon in the upper right of this image. That's the pollutograph approach, 
where you effectively have a time series of your concentrations of bacteria, DO, BOD, et cetera. Um, and that also is a very solid approach that works really well. So you have three options for how your constituents can get into the bottle. Now, if you're converting a bottle, let's say you have a bottle from WASP or Sequal or Qual2K or HSPF on the shelf. A few things you want to be mindful of as you get into the conversion is that, and I don't mean this as a negative statement, but Inforx's water quality bottling has some British roots to it. Um, so biochemical oxygen demand is going to be a five-day BOD, whereas EPA WASP is going to be looking for an ultimate BOD. So you may remember that equation from undergrad, uh, wastewater engineering, you'll need to convert. And then some of the uh, other specialty water quality bottles can use a variable decay rate for BOD. Um, if you have, say, Michaelis Medden type kinetics where it's saturated, whereas at ICM, uh, you're using a constant, um, one, one per day uh, variable, de uh, constant decay rate for BOD. Um, for phosphorus, is your, if your sampling data is coming in at total phosphorus, that's great. ICM models it as total phosphorus. Now, phosphorus is split between orthophosphate, which is biologically available, can be taken up by the algae, as well as what's not biologically available. It's usually lumped in as organic phosphorus or something like that. InfoWorks maintains that split, but it won't tell you that. It's kind of under the hood. Um, not actually a bad idea for a future update, by the way, to be able to show that. Um, but you just see total phosphorus coming back out, whereas a program like EPA WASP will split the orthophosphate, the unavailable phosphorus. If you're modeling algae, ICM will track that concentration as total algae, um, whereas a program like WASP will look at it as just the chlorophyll A, the reactive part of the algae that we care about for photosynthesis. And then if you want to have sediment oxygen demand, which exists in virtually every um, urban river as various things have settled over time, that the sediment is pulling oxygen out of the water that's passing over it. Um, that's, that works very well in Inforx ICM, but it's attached to the active layer of sediment, not the passive layer, which means where you have um, sediment oxygen demand taking place, that sediment could get scoured downstream or could accumulate further upstream. Um, if you want it on the passive layer, just be a constant um, a user process could be set up, and I'll have an example of that shortly. So separate model groups or integrated model groups. The advantage of an integrated model group for hydraulics and water quality is you just have one master model group. You're going to do one run. You're going to get one, everything out of your simulation. And you have the ability of that to characterize the transport of sediment from your collection system to your storm ditches and your rivers. The reasons to use a separate uh, model group, basically having one for your pipes and one for your rivers, is that that closely resembles the traditional coupled approaches we often see in the U.S. That say you have swim and wasp as your water quality model. Um, well, you could do the exact same thing at InfoWorks. You basically just have InfoWorks and InfoWorks, two separate model groups. Also, the receiving stream model group is going to be streamlined to just the receiving stream, so it'll run a lot faster. There won't be any other pipes there. And if your practice, say your utility, that you're in your hydraulic model and in forks every single day, and water quality is something you maybe do twice a year, maybe once a year, there's really no interference in your hydraulic modeling workflow because the water quality is maintained in a separate group. And you also don't need to work with sediment transport. You can use a pollutograph approach, take the output of your hydraulics group, and then bring that into your water quality model. So I want to give an example of what uh, separate model groups could look like. This is a combined sewer system. It's a screenshot out of ICM. So in the first model group, we have the green lines, which is the combined sewer network, and we have these thinner blue lines that are ditches and creeks. What these elements are are things we're modeling flow, modeling the full hydraulics in, but we're not interested in simulating for water quality. In the second group, we start with the big blue river that's in the center, with some other elements, like the purple things are basically connections. Those are literally um, just getting the combined sewer outfall to the river segment, as well as some point loads that we have for, for dry weather or other sources. And then we get our pollutographs generated from the flows. So the results, the output of group one, we have inflow time series, as well as pollutographs that then go into group two to simulate the water quality. The only hydraulics for simulated water quality is just the movement of water um, through the system. And this, is, this process has worked very well, the case studies that I'll show. So now I'd like to get into my dissolved oxygen case studies. 
both from two great forward-thinking utilities in the great state of Indiana. Um, I'll give the majority of the presentation on Citizens Energy Group, the Water Wastewater Authority um, utility for Indianapolis. And then I'll briefly present an evaluation done for Fort Wayne City Utilities for one of their polishing plants. Now, while this is a full hour log uh, presentation and Q&A that we have, I can't quite cover everything on the Indianapolis case study. So for some more information, we do have a paper in the March, April to 2017 issue of the Stormwater Magazine, um, which still is publicly available. You can Google that, you can find it. Uh, this link I think might be clickable, might not be. Uh, but we present a little bit more detail, some of our rate constants, some of the specifics of the pollutographs in that paper. And also, this was published a little over four years ago. We did this in an earlier version of InfoWorks ICM, obviously, than what's around today. And we might have done a few things differently as there's been some other water quality capability that's been brought in. So a little bit of background. Indianapolis is a fairly large city with a combined sewer system and a combined sewer overflow long-term control plan, similar to a lot of the other larger Midwestern cities. And we our plan was approved in 2006 with completion in 2025. And for someone like me who's been on this program for a while, it's, you know, I kind of remind myself, hey, this is coming up. We actually are wrapping this up shortly. And for the original long-term control plan in 2006, some previous water quality modeling was done in version 5.1 of EPA WASP, and that is a purely DOS-based version. Uh, everything is text and command prompt. And there was a separate module for E. coli bacteria, the TOXI module, and then a separate module for dissolved oxygen, which is known as the UTRO module, eutrophication in WASP, and that was dissolved oxygen, including nitrogen, phosphorus, algae, and sediment, because we do have diurnal swings of DO of the Indianapolis rivers. So important thing to note, if you spend a lot of time in collection system, uh, storm system modeling, and you wanna get into water quality, is that you will have different extents. Well, the collection system model covers citizen system, which is the majority, uh, majority of Marion County, Indianapolis. The water quality model extends an additional 240 kilometers to the Southwest. It is the full West Fork of the White River all the way to its confluence with the East Fork. So we have about 300 kilometers of stream and river that we're modeling. And the legacy model was calibrated to flow and sampling data all the way back to 2001, from August to September. So why convert from WASP to ICM? Well, citizens purchased ICM in 2012 and converted the collection system model over to it. And then I raised this question in quotes almost verbatim. You know, we've already paid for the water quality modeling capability, so why not use it and leverage it? And there are also some concerns within citizens about IT support for this legacy DOS water quality model. Um, you know, what happens when you upgrade the Windows operating system again and again and again? Will this still run? Will this still work? Is there an important regulatory question that develops so we find ourselves scrambling for this model? And this also gave us an opportunity to recalibrate to current sampling and streamflow data. The city of Indianapolis, uh, going back to the early 90s, has maintained a network of sampling stations known as the Rivers Monitoring Program, and we can leverage data from that program and recalibration. So the way the conversion process looked was like this. We took the individual WASP and SWIP models, and their associated pre-processing tools, and brought them into InfoWorks. And I would really like to emphasize the S in models of that statement. We had multiple model files for each of the different elements, multiple spreadsheets, and other tools to bring everything together. The water quality model was um, originally developed in 1997, and it's, it was a great process, but we only had so much computing power back then. Um, so we wanted to maintain the pollutograph approach that we had with ICM. We had some concerns that if we brought in sediment transport, it would potentially be a little bit of a distraction. Um, does Infox per Quebec City levels to deal modeling? I'll get into that in a second. Um, just want to check the questions real quick. Yeah, yeah, we had a question come in about complexity of the DO modeling. So. All right, I'll show that. I'll show that in a few slides, actually. So good timing. And then we recalibrate to current data and modify rate constants as needed. Um, oh, I got to get back to this at the down arrow. Um, so obviously, in a water quality model, you always start with your hydrodynamics. Um, you at least want to get through flow, stage, the movement of water. Um, temperature is also a good idea to get done before you get into water quality, um, if, if applicable. 
So flow calibration was done in 2013. Uh, we selected two wet weather events. We had good rain and we had gram samples collected those days. And we had a really good flow calibration. What we found was that flow in the rivers that wasn't due to rainfall, you know, if we had a lot of snow melt in upstream counties um, or releases from a reservoir, that's not something we could simulate, but we have the ability to get USGS data and hard code it if that's the dominant source of flow in our events. So on the dissolved oxygen side of things, um, you have the ability in setting up your runs for which parameters you want to use. Um, so you can begin with just DO and BOD like your Streeter Phelps. I don't know if you could do modified Streeter Phelps. I think the moment you select nitrogen, you also have to bring in nitrate and TKN, which is basically the total, I'll mispronounce it if I say what it, the acronym, but it's basically the total nitrogen in organic and organic in the stream. You, then you can check phosphorus and algae individually. Um, and when you do bring in algae, um, you do have to add solar radiation data, which is typically available from any um, nearby climate station, either at an airport or university. Um, so we maintain the same structure of having phosphorus algae in the full nitrogen species. And our calibration was done in 2015, and we got within a milligram per liter for DO, biochemical oxygen demand, and ammonia nitrogen. Our rate constants and pollutographs are consistent with the legacy calibration. There's some modification. And we built a user process for sediment oxygen demand um, so we wouldn't have to go ahead and calibrate to sediment transport. So the charts you're looking at flows right to left, and that'll be a common theme in all the charts I'm going to show. Um, this is the simulated dissolved oxygen matching up with the time the samples were taken uh, for individual gram samples. And then for two continuous dissolved oxygen stations, the daily diurnal swing is shown to just show the overall range. And looking at those uh, at the diurnal swing, uh, this is what this is the wave release station at the downstream end. Where you see those fluctuations in DO, that is DO grows at night, or sorry, grows during the mornings, and then comes back down, um, back down at night. And we're able to represent that fairly well, um, getting that well within a milligram per liter. So we feel pretty confident about using this water quality model in applications. If you don't see the kind of fluctuations, you don't necessarily need to bring in algae. It's obviously not required if you're mostly BOD or, or nitrate phosphorus driven. So for BOD, um, not a very large concentration for these events, just a couple of milligrams per liter, um, but a very good fit against the sampling data that we had. Again, flows moving right to left. So you might be asking at this point, well, Chris, okay, that's great. You took the water quality bottle, you brought it into InfoWorks, everything was there, you got it validated to current data. What did you use it for? Like, well, this, you know, this would be a fairly short presentation if we didn't have an application. Um, so like every other wastewater utility, Citizens has an NPDES permit for its treatment plants. And the limits for dissolved oxygen at the plant go all the way back to a 1975 waste load allocation study done by the State Board of Health. And that analysis was a modified Streeter Phelps equation done on Fortran punch cards, which I think is some absolutely legendary work. That's definitely harder than any modeling I've ever done in my life. And this, the effluent limit for dissolved oxygen, it was based on that waste load allocation, but it was also based on a far less stringent ammonia limit at the time. So for overall river water quality, Indianapolis, now citizens, was required to supersaturate their effluent by adding liquid oxygen or peroxides to make up for the fact that more ammonia would be discharged and it would effectively balance out the river. Well, the need for that supersaturation had effectively gone away because from 1975 into the 90s and early 2000s, the ammonia limits had been ratcheted down based on acute aquatic toxicity to ammonia. Those standards didn't exist in 75. So the, the supersaturated effluent limit was really window dressing. We were meeting the ammonia standard. Um, it really wasn't necessary. So in the permit renewal conversations, we asked if the water quality model could be used to evaluate alternative limits. Um, one of the first things the state authority asked is, well, could you recreate the 75 analysis in your water quality model? Um, so that's what you're looking at on this chart. So again, flow is right to left. The green line is the 1975 waste load allocation. By the way, I'd like to point out that looking at a 40-year-old chart and getting the dots red and into Excel is maybe a little harder than what you might think offhand. 
Um, and then the blue line is our recreation of that analysis. So, so for citizens looking at this, we brought in every load, every flow rate, temperature, rate constant, everything that was published with that WLA. And we successfully verified within half a milligram per liter. And that is the best anyone is going to do. Because when we bring in nitrogen, we don't have the ability to turn off nitrate. Um, we, there's some underlying variance in the two algorithms we're looking at. But after this was put together, we had made a presentation on site to the state authority. We showed them how the model works. And then we started to look at different alternatives. If we discharge a different effluent DO, dissolved oxygen, maintained ammonia and everything else, what that would look like in the river. And that proved to be a successful application that in the final 2018 permit, the summer dissolved oxygen limits no longer require supersaturated conditions. So there isn't the operational need to augment the final effluent just to meet a number for dissolved oxygen. And permits, by the way, are a five-year renewal. Um, so this will come up again in 2013 if there's other things that may need to be reevaluated. Citizens has a water quality model to evaluate these things. So I'd like to briefly talk about the city of Fort Wayne. Um, Pond 3 is at the Paul L. Bremer Water Pollution Control Plant. It's the single plant that they maintain. Uh, they've got over about, about a quarter of a million people that live in Fort Wayne. Um, it's a 30-acre pond. It's optionally used for effluent polishing and conveyance. As it receives flow from a chlorine contact tank, it can discharge it through a static aerator to the Maumee River. Now, if you're not familiar with Northeast Indiana, the Maumee River then flows east uh, towards Toledo and, the, and Lake Erie. And like any other pond, whether it's man-made or natural, the dissolved oxygen will be impacted by algal effects and by temperature which typically is more of an impact in summertime than the rest of the year. So in getting into this analysis, the one thing I found is that there's a lot of advantages of modeling at a treatment plant site. Because you have time series data for pretty much every parameter of interest, things you would never get um, if you're looking at a river or an estuary or lake. So I built an ICM model representing the pod as a serpentine, serpentine channel, which is how it's operated, what it's operated. And we, again, this was another model that we had phosphorus, algae, solar radiation, the full nitrogen cycle. It was verified to a warm, um, low flow period in October 2014. We, we feel really good about having an entire month of data that we were consistent with the observed data in red, the models in green. And then we verified, we use a verified model to look at different options. You know, what's the performance in intermittent operation? What if the pond's clean to remove the algal effects? Is that a positive or a negative? And then what if additional aeration is added heading into the pond to some redundancy, which the city utilities actually did construct the additional aeration to augment their optional operation of the pond. So now I wanna briefly talk about bacteria as I'm winding down here. Um, again, Citizens Energy Group, Indianapolis will be the case study. Um, I've already talked about the setup with the two model groups and how flows are calibrated, so I'm not going to redo all of those details. Um, but E. coli bacteria was modeled in WASP as a single toxicant with die-off and first flush pollutographs as the particularly combined sewer discharge, which is a mixture of sewage and rainwater. The first flush, the early part of the discharge, usually has stronger things like bacteria, nitrogen, things like that. So we wanted to make sure we maintained that in our pollutograph approach. So bacteria calibration was done in 2013. We had great consistency with the available grab sampling data, as well as historical maximums at the sites. And a oh, question on the ponds. Oh, let me get in. I'll, I'll get into that at the end since I'm already into the deeper, um, uh, the deeper yeah, bacteria piece. Just, just for everyone else's reference, the question is about the uh, physical baffles to behave uh, serpentine uh, for those ponds, or was it a, was it dye studied? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll get through that. Let me talk about bacteria and I'll, I'll circle back to that. Um, and then we our die-off and our pollutographs, they were consistent with the legacy calibration laws. Now, if you've worked with combined sewer overflow programs or urban programs in general, um, you always show bacteria to log scale. So our model and sample concentrations are between about 1,000 to 7,000 colony forming units per 100 millions. Whether you're E. coli or, or fecal, you're roughly this order bag. What you know is that, I was after we click after I check a question, under 10,000, that's not a combined sewer overflow discharge influence. That's the residual stormwater. So at the time the sampling took place, the CSO mass has already gone through. 
This was a two and a quarter inch rate event that happened in 2011. And the majority of the combined sewer overflow projects had not been all, they were not built or active by then. We would expect to see concentrations closer to 100,000, maybe even approaching a million in the river. So in order to make sure we had the CSO piece of the bacteria model calibrated right, we looked at the historical maximums, which was the exact same thing Indianapolis did in 2001. So each red triangle here is the historical max that was sampled at any site. The red, the dashed red, was the legacy 2001 model, and the light and the dark blue is the current model. We have a much better fit against that sampling data. Now I'd like to be clear that we have a better fit, not because InfoWorks is superior to WASP and modeling bacteria. I would say they're functionally equivalent. It's superior because significant investments happened on the hydraulic model. You have a better CSO model, a better representation of CSO flows, and therefore we can represent that, load that into our water quality model a lot better than what we previously had. So let's see. So as I'm winding down here, so applications of bacteria, we're looking at durations and upstream impairment, the impacts of the CSO LVC projects versus other bacteria sources. So again, we're looking at log scale. This output is a couple of months that was run from a historical period. And we're assuming the combined sewer overflows have been brought to post LTCP, post 2025 conditions. And then all the other stormwater loads are as they're understood today. So we know that dry weather brings us up to about 100 colony forming units per milliliter, about halfway to the daily maximum bacteria standard. We know that our combined sewer overflow discharges will be very brief following the completion of the CSO program. The majority of the impairment exceeding the standard is actually due to urban stormwater. It's nothing to do with combined sewer overflows. In fact, you could fully eliminate the combined sewer overflows and you'd still see the same magnitude of impairment in this water body for this type of three month period. And that's, that's an important piece for informing the program as it's moving ahead into projects being completed in post-construction monitoring. So I'd like to briefly talk about the benefits and limitations of water quality modeling, and then I will get back to that question after I go through these details. So a primary benefit is really the data management and data integrity. If you bring your water quality model into your work group data server, and it's sitting there as a model group, you never have to ask yourself that question, hey, where is that old water quality model saved? It might be on this server drive. Maybe there's a CD in the library. You can spare yourself from all that. And if the applications are infrequent, maybe once a year, twice a year, at least it's in a software package you're using every day. You know the structure of ICM, you know how to work it. And also there's simulation integrity with the rainfall profiles and pollutographs. Um, you may have a love-hate relationship with this integrity, but you know when you use a rainfall profile or pollutograph in a run, you can't change it. It's locked. So you know where your input was that aligns with the output you're looking at for every simulation you do. Um, you can fully integrate this with the pipe network, or you can deploy it in separate model groups like I've presented in these case studies. And I'd like to point out that the case studies were done a few years back, so the capability is a little different today. Um, there's fully equivalent capability in 1D, one dimension to the specialized water quality software packages. With version 7, 2D capability was incorporated, and that's for overland flows. But from discussions Ryan and I had, we think there's the potential to use um, the 2D mesh effectively as the river bathymetry and bring in some 2D capability. And there's also flexibility with user processes as well, like I showed for sediment oxygen. Um, some limitations, which I believe are truly minor. Um, in water quality modeling and forks, know your parameters and your unit conversions, um, particularly if you're coming from an established US-based model, total phosphorus versus orthophosphate, ultimate BOD versus 5D BOD. And then a few technical limitations to be considered. If you wanna use the ICM buildup and wash off, you will be doing it through sediment. You have the ability after version nine to use the swim, the swim version, which doesn't require sediment. And then also, um, this is identical to WASP, a EPA WASP model, but the reiteration is a function of velocity, which is great. That's what it's supposed to be. Um, however, if you have a big stream that comes into a lake and flow slows down or flow reverses, the DO can artificially drop. The dissolved oxygen, a model like WASP will use a boundary concentration to address that, um, but that's something to watch out for in review and post-processing. You still have reiteration happening through the surface of the stream or river, 
um, but a velocity representation will pick that up. And then last up, sediment OD, oxygen demand is based on the active and the transportable sediment layers. And before I get to my acknowledgements, I'd actually like to reopen the questions here. Um, so first off, for the pods, did it have physical baffles or behave um, as a serpentine channel? Uh, there wasn't a specific dye study that's done, but there were baffles present in the pod, is how I remember it. Um, and we effectively set up the channel to, to represent that flow path. Um, there wasn't a, a dye study done for that specific analysis. Um, temperature, that's a very good question, is absolutely part of the process. Um, you have the ability at Inforx to either model temperature as a constant, um, or you can model it as a constituent, um, where you would have pollutographs and you'd be able to see um, thermal effects that, you know, colder water um, coming in the river that warmer water from a discharge can be evaluated. Everything I've shown has a constant temperature. Um, that's typically done as a conservative assumption. You know, model DO for your 7Q10, assuming a good July temperature, if you're at NPDES permit application. Um, combine sewers DO, take a look at that summer condition where you're at a warmer temperature. It just brings in some conservancy to it. Um, and then also a question about pollutants from the collection system model vary over time. Um, yes, yeah, so with pollutographs, um, you do have the ability to vary them over time. Um, what the legacy process used was taking some of the SWIB output and then using some spreadsheets to develop first flush pollutographs. Um, we've effectively mimicked that in Inforx using spreadsheets as well as some Python scripting. Um, but yes, if you're using flows to der derive your um, your constituent pollutants, things like nitrate, nitrogen, phosphorus, BOD, I would expect there to be some temporal variation um, that you can use as you're building up your pollutographs. Um, so yeah, I'd like to acknowledge Citizens Energy Group and Fort Wayne City Utilities uh, for letting me talk about the case studies today. Again, for citizens, we do have a paper in the March to April 2017 issue of the Stormwater Magazine that goes into this in a little bit more detail. And I believe that is my final slide. Um, yeah, so, so we, yeah, we, we did here. address some of those questions, like you mentioned about uh, the temperature effects on water quality and the uh, pollutants modeling with that collection system. Uh, there, there was one more that has come in. Uh, for temperature, is is there something in between constant and a full heat flux model, for example, time series of temperatures? Uh, yes. Oh, hi, Peter. Nice to see you. Um, yeah, so, so the way InfoWorks um, does this, I think it actually is the in-between. Um, it treats temperature as a conservative pollutant, so just the standard mixing and evening um, uh, of temperature. So yeah, if you have a source coming in at 30, uh, uh, 30 C and your river is 20 C, it's going to balance and average that out. Um, I've typically worked with constant temperatures. Um, adding the time series approach does add a little bit of complexity, but but it is effective. Um, I don't know if there's a full-blown heat flux model. I don't think it's um, you have the ability to warm the stream with solar radiation. I think the solar radiation only plugs in in the, the algal effects. Yeah, so we're, we're getting a, a number of um, questions in now. So. Um, is this what what kind of decay is this? Is this linear? Is this nonlinear? Is it flexible? Um, so that so a lot of the the best answer I could say is both. Um, so so most of the if say you're just modeling um, phosphorus on its own, um, you would have a linear decay coefficient, you know, KD of one per day. Um, BOD, you obviously have something similar. But when you're modeling multiple constituents, it is nonlinear in the sense that the reactions are taking place. Um, the thetas are there for the temperature corrections on, um, on the coefficients. Um, so DO is going to be a funct dissolved oxygen will be a function of BOD decay, um, reiteration, the nitrogen and phosphorus um, as, uh, as nitrogen, as nitrate denitrifies, becomes TKN, and then eventually cycles back to ammonia. Um, so in, in, in the straightforward approach of decay, those constants are all linear. Um, so we had to make an approximation. We basically took the midpoint in changing a, a michaelis men variable BOD decay rate to a constant one in the Indianapolis example. 
but it's also, uh, you know, it's also interacting with all the other pollutants. Um, I'm sorry for the, that was a bit of a rambly answer. Um, <laughs> question okay. on the grid, um, allowing for the modeling of plumes. Um, this is not something I've tested out myself. This is from a conversation uh, Ryan and I had a, a week or two ago when we were setting this up. Um, and that, you know, for what Ryan showed is that some larger rivers have been effectively modeled in 2D um, using the grid as the, the, the river base, the bathymetry. Um, I haven't tested the water quality yet, but I believe the capabilities there, and hopefully we'll have a, a case study that for for to see maybe in one of these future water talks six months or a year from now. Yeah, because I, I would imagine you could just uh, apply the inflow and the pollutograph to a two D point source within the mesh, and then uh, kind of effectively do it like that. Um, Got one more in here. Any recommendations within the collection system to improve overall water quality, especially at CSO discharge points? So, so the question of improving water quality and combined sewer systems, I mean, that's what the 1994 CSO policy and, you know, moving its way down to the integrated planning framework in 2012 um, have all sought to address. So that's a uh, I might need a, a full hour to answer this question. <laughs> That's okay. We got, um, we got 15 minutes. I won't please. do that for everybody because you wouldn't get an extra PDH for that. Um, <laughs> so, the you know the the primary means that CSOs are dealt with in the U.S. is often to capture them. And so, it's a great infrastructure solution to park them in storage tunnels or to build additional treatment facilities to then discharge treated water. Um, also, CSOs are reduced by being captured in green infrastructure. Um, other improvements that are done in the stream, um, there are side stream aeration fountains that are deployed in a handful of communities in the U.S. and I believe in Europe as well to kind of improve natural reaeration. Um, flow augmentation is, is done as well, um, you know, add some additional dilution flow. Um, but the, to really get water quality where it should be, um, there's often a combined sewer long-term control plan, a consent decree with Department of Justice and federal EPA, and it's a large program to, to get to those end goals um, for compliance with the Clean Water Act. Uh, but the water quality models are very helpful in screening alternatives. I guess that's, well, if I do green infrastructure or gray infrastructure, which might have the better overall impact. Um, it's really helpful in selecting the, the approach you want to take. Yeah, that, that, that's all the questions we've had so far. Um, I'll I'll ask a question that I kind of asked you before uh, uh, we got on here, but I think it would be uh, interesting to share. Um, just in general, like from your experience in, in doing these types of water quality models, um, how do you see them fitting uh, overall in the um, kind of framework of most people's plans uh, in, in being able to manage their MPDS permits and TMDLs and things like that. Uh, yeah, and, and Ryan, I think I had a fairly rambling answer we talked earlier, so let me see if I can take <laughs> it. Um, so, so for municipal utility, I mean, it's really going to come down with the relationship that exists with the state authority because they'll own the permitting process, um, you know, a lot of the combined sewer program pieces as well, the TMDLs. Um, so it really comes out to you know, can you be a can a municipal utility be a partner with the state in something like a TMDL versus the state doing this on their own with their own watershed group and contractors? Um, you know, for citizens, it's been really helpful to to work with the state and provide some input into into their programs and working with their watershed modeling team. Um, there's also a third party TMDL process that exists if a municipal utility wants to try to take ownership of updating that TMDL. Um, but really, as we get uh, water quality modeling, you know, so, so as we get the combined sewer programs more into post-construction monitoring and we're assessing the actual compliance and performance, I can, I can see more water quality modeling being done um, to, to supplement the data that's being collected um, in forward grab samples and DO probes and things like that. Gotcha. Uh, we did have one more come in. Uh, what about the water quality model uh, verification rather than calibration? Um, yeah, yes. Okay. And whether you're looking at a hydraulic model or water quality model, the words verification calibration can sometimes be blurred. 
um, a bit. You know, obviously, I like to think of a verification as you know an additional independent event where we don't tweak anything. Um, and for for the case studies I've shown, we have done those for some select historical events or recent events. Um, but the questions you want to be asking yourself is, have you collected enough data to be representative for the questions you want to answer? Um, a limitation of the Indianapolis case study was that the 2001 recalibration was done to very low flow conditions in August to September. So we always knew before we updated it starting in 2012 that we were right in the summer conditions and the dry fall conditions, but we knew we were conservative in springtime of the rest of the year. And in our update 2011-2012, we were able to bring in some springtime data and get more of a representative overall fit. Um, you know, another another piece of this question um, for certain is, you know, really just can you have continuous, you know, year-round data um, or, or things like that to have additional events to verify the input of your models? Um, you know, be thinking about the end outcomes. If it's dissolved oxygen or bacteria, um, that you have the ability to assess improvements or changes with confidence. Good stuff. Um... Well, that, that seems to be all the questions we have. I know we're just a little bit early. Um, I certainly don't have anything else to say, but I, I just really appreciate, uh, Chris, you coming on, uh, sharing your expertise over the years, um, all that kind of thing. Um, it looks like Maurice did slip in a question here. Uh, what extensions do you need to do all this? Uh, none, uh, I believe. Uh, they're, it's all part of the... Um, the ICM package, uh, there, we, we've really only got one add-on, which would be the ICM suite, which uh, allows the TSDB connection, uh, risk master, and um, probability distribution moisture model. Um, so those are the only things that would need to have an extension for. So all the water quality stuff is all packaged here, but... Um, yeah, yeah that's, that's it'll be a bit like that was helpful that you know it was in the base price so that that, that helped us get going yeah um, it, and, and if i could jump in really quick ryan like, sure. Sure, depending sure. on how if you want to do that that coupled uh two separate model group approach and use pollutographs depending on how you want to set that up um you may benefit from tsdb depending on how you want to manage to develop your pollutographs but go ahead um, I was just going to say, I, I think it's a perfect example of, uh, you know, leveraging the full power of Inforex ICM. There's there's so many components to it that it can be uh, used for really anything from the simplest problems to uh, something more complex. And, and it's it, it's really a, a I feel like a building effort where you, you, you know, you might start out with that um, just a watershed master plan or something like that. You have that model already there, so you might as well add some water quality yeah. stuff in there too. Um, got another question about the reliability of water quality modeling compared to hydrodynamic. Um, I guess I'm not 100% sure uh, what exactly that means. Of is it is it as accurate, I guess, as hydrodynamic modeling? Uh, I mean, in general, water quality modeling, you, you, there's a bit of an art form to it when you compare it with hydrodynamics or hydraulics. I mean, the, the sampling data is naturally going to be more variable. You're not going to be able to collect the kind of data that you can in flow metering or gauging. Um, but having dug into this, I mean, a lot of the underlying equations and algorithms are very similar to what's done in a program like WASP or SQL. Um, there's obviously going to be different, a few variations here and there, some custom things that exist um, within WASP and SQL that are a little different in InfoWorks, um, which is why I wanted to present some of those differences and talk about things like the phosphorus versus orthophosphate. Um, but really, they, they are functionally equivalent um, compared to other specialty programs. Um, I would say overall that there will always be a little bit more uncertainty in water quality modeling than you'll have on the hydrodynamic side, uh, regardless of your software. Um, and, and one other question that I, I have that uh, um, I, I just thought of, um, and I'm sorry if I missed it, but what kind of uh, parameters uh, are, are you really tweaking in, in some of the um, calibration uh, steps? Is it is it mostly changing like pollutographs? Is it just changing the decay rates? 
Um, yeah, it's it, it is a little interactive in, in that area. So so back to I'll, I'll start with bacteria because that's easy. Um, it's just one thing on its own. Um, in bacteria, you're looking at your polluter your source load input. If you have any point loads, um, you're looking at modifying those. And then the main parameter in bacteria is effectively your die-off, which at InfoWorks is a T90, or the time for 90% uh, die-off, you know, one log down to 10%. Okay. Um, so like KD of 1.0 per day is like a, I can't remember, it's like 46 hours or 48 hours or something like that. Um, I can't remember that equation offhand. Um, but then if you're working, say, dissolved oxygen with like ammonia, nitrogen, BOD, You'll have re, you'll have a reiteration coefficient um, that's velocity based for all of your uh, river channel strength segments for DO. You'll have specific reiteration at weirs, which are dams basically, or any other special structure like the uh, static aerator that was in the Fort Wayne case study. Um, you, then you have uh, you know you have, you have different coefficients for DO being consumed by BOD, BOD being decaying on its own, the conversions of um, ammonia nitrogen to nitrate and oxygen is consumed. Those are all uh, rate constants that are done. Um, you have your thetas for temperature corrections. Um, so it is a little interactive in the dissolved oxygen calibration. Um, and that's where you know, doing some automated runs or just doing a batch to get a sense of sensitivity um, can be really helpful um, in, in getting the calibration put together. Gotcha. Um... Well, we are pretty close to the hour now, so glad uh, we stuck around and had some more questions come in. Great stuff. Uh, really appreciate everyone uh, joining today, but I, I think that's where we'll close it. Thanks again, Chris, uh, for all your expertise and, and knowledge that you're yeah. able to share with us. Appreciate it uh, for sure. Is there anything you want to wrap up with? Um, no, just Ryan, just really appreciate uh, yeah the, your your time and the opportunity to come and present today. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Thanks a lot. Appreciate it. We'll uh, see you guys next time.